Hi everyone, welcome to this video where I discuss an important encounter from round 2 of Altibox Norway Chess 2020. But before we get going on that front, I would like to share some of the pictures from round 2 with you. Here's a picture of Levon Aronian playing against Aryan Tari in round 2. Levon managed to play a fantastic game and he won it. Uh, so he moves, he opens his score after losing to Carlsen in round 1. That's Alireza Firuja, the youngster playing against Magnus Carlsen. What a match that was between the two. Uh, it ended in a draw in the classical section. As you can see, there are three pawns on the board, just a rook on each side. Uh, and then <laughs> this is a nice image. By the way, all these pictures are taken by Lennart Utis, who is one of the top photographers in the world of chess. Magnus Carlsen saying something to Ali Reza. This is Magnus greeting him before the game in his typical Namaste style. I like it very much. Uh, and Carlsen talking to the interviewers after winning the Armageddon. I have some pictures of that as well. Uh, before the game, the world champion uses the hand sanitizer to stay safe. Uh, this is the game which we are going to discuss in this video. This is Karuana versus Duda. Karuana managed to beat Duda in a very, very interesting encounter. Uh, Duda under pressure, their top Polish player uh, and a very, very strong youngster. He's going to, going to make it big in the years to come. Uh, that's Kazim Zhanov over here. This He's the man behind all of the, <laughs> I couldn't say all, but many of Karuana's brilliant opening novelties. Uh, Rustam Kazimjanov, former FIDE world champion uh, and this is an image of Ali Reza losing on time to Carlsen in the Armageddon. This was very similar to World Rapid where the position was drawn but uh, Ali Reza, uh, you know, played his move, the piece fell down and he ran out of time. Uh, this is a picture of Magnus Carlsen's father Henrik Carlsen talking to uh, Norwegian press. Uh, and coming back, you can see how Ali Reza has made his move, but the rook sort of falls off. He sometimes makes these moves which are not very clean. You know, they are hanging in the air and that's what happened. Magnus Carlsen shows him the clock. What wonderful pictures taken by Lennart, capturing every moment. Uh, Aryan Tari losing to Aronian, just, but he's learning so much from this event. Here you can see them, him uh, surprised. And I think when you play such an event, even though you may lose so many games, your chess level grows. And so those were the pictures that I wanted to show, which gives you a feel of the second round of the Altibox Norway 2020. And now time for the game. Here's the chess board we have. Here's the game Karuana versus Duda. And here's the image between the two. Okay, I'll place myself in the center now. And let's begin the game. So the game started off with d4, Karuana white, d5, c4, c6, slough defense. And he took on d5. And this is where uh, I want to discuss this exchange slough variation with you. And I believe that it's a very, very interesting line uh, that, that white players can play. It looks drawish in nature, but it actually is not. You know, there are lot, there is a lot of play in it. So first bishop f4, I think people have come to the conclusion that this is the most accurate move order because if you go knight c3, then e5 is one line which may be doing pretty well for black. And also, if you go knight f3, sometimes you really don't want to develop your knight on f3. It uh, takes away quite a bit of the flexibility in your position as you will see in the game white develops his knight to e2 later so bishop f4 now knight c6 and e3 so you stopped all e5 ideas in the position and next you will develop knight c3 knight f6 and now knight c3 is the main move but once again karuana goes for relatively lesser played move only 10 games until now with bishop b5 it's like white is developing bishops ahead of knights bishop d7 knight c3 a6 and bishop d3 and you may ask yourself why didn't karuana play bishop d3 here itself why did he have to go to b5 
provoke uh bishop d7 and then go a6 i believe and i think this is very important a6 creates small weaknesses on b6 and c5 square for black and that is the reason why you would love black to play this move because later the knight goes to a4 and starts poking these little weaknesses and you will see this happening in the game as well so in the exchange slav <clears throat> black many times has to play a6 because this there are these threats with nb5 nc7 with the bishop looking here but when he does that he faces these issues now bishop g4 is a is an interesting move you could play e6 but then that just blocks the bishop on d7 so when you go bishop g4 knight g e2 e6 castles and now i was surprised at duda's next move which was bishop takes e2 i did not understand this move entirely because first of all why not just bishop e7 let's say rook e1 castles i still think white has a small edge after knight a4 because now he is looking here at these squares and once the knight settles on c5 let's say a random move here knight c5 either black has to give up his bishop or he has to uncomfortably look at these pawns you know uh, how to defend them after bishop c5 rook c5 i feel that white is definitely better with the bishop pair in this position so duda said anyway let me give up this bishop because i have placed my pawns on dark on light squares and this bishop might not be the best piece so i'm giving it up and i'll play with my remaining pieces on the board Karuana played a3 castles and knight to a4 and as you can see now he is looking to try and gain a grip on the dark squares h6 was played here there was a previous game between richard rapport and bogo sau saujik in this position which went queen a5 queen c2 rook c8 knight to c5 queen d8 take on b7 knight d4 ed rook c2 knight d8 rook b2 and knight c6 when uh, white was a piece up and went on to win this game but uh, duda played h6 now bishop g3 knight d7 h3 just making sure that the back rank weaknesses are taken care of i was also very surprised why karuana was not putting his rook to c1 but i think he's waiting you know he's trying to gauge where to put his rooks and here he played queen d1 now b4 is coming up next so the queen defends the knight rook f c8 b4 and the queen jumps back black says my position is harmonious i like it and here you see karuana not putting his rook on c1 actually gives him an opportunity now to put it on b1 and after knight c5 look at the b7 square rook a7 knight to c5 knight b8 and now i like the next move queen to e2 connecting the two rooks and these are these little moves at the same time now b6 becomes impossible because a6 is handy so a5 rook c1 ab ab and now b6 could have been possible but i guess it would lead to a similar position in the game like b5 and sort of cramping him but knight f6 b5 b6 finally and knight to a6 and you will see that this knight although is on the edge of the board first of all blocks the a file secondly controls the c7 square so black can no longer double over there or you know anyway c7 was controlled by the bishop but this knight is doing a great job and white is clearly better here he has control over the c file bishop is active this bishop is pretty good he has more space queen can come to c2 and then later on infiltrate inside you can see how in an exchange slav he still white managed to get a very very solid edge it's not easy d7 rook c6 queen f8 now doubling threatening rook c8 rook went back to a8 rook c7 bishop d6 he took took and in came queen to c6 
attacking the rook and also the queen and after take uh, pawn takes would be just finish you know i play my rook here next move i go c7 maybe rook b8 that's all over so he went queen f8 but now after takes takes queen takes this is a winning position for white two pieces against rook by the way it's not so simple not easy because in order for two pieces to win against a rook they need to find a weakness in black's camp and here the pieces joining in to find a weakness was not easy while black's play was pretty straightforward he came in with his rook and now he could have you know uh he exchanged the queens. He, he realized that if he keeps the queen on the board, like I, I was thinking of a variation like queen a3. But then it turns out that the queen and knight coordinate beautifully. And there is a mating attack building up here. So queen c8 was logical. And here uh, is, a, is a difficult technical position to win. But I think white should win this endgame slowly and steadily. But you have to understand that this pawn is not so easy to attack because it's on a dark square and the bishop can't get to it. And also the rook is very active. So in order to win, white must create a weakness in black's camp. And this he managed to do actually uh, with some help by the opponent. Because there was a moment I think when uh, Karu, uh, when Duda had the draw in his grasp here, g4. And here, maybe rook b2 is a nice move. Because the only winning plan that white can have here is to play f4. This is the only break I think he can have. And Duda can constantly keep, you know, uh, causing problems with move like rook b3, stopping f4 because now e3 would hang. Or rook b1, attacking the bishop on f1. I feel that this tactics would have led to uh very difficult difficulty for white to win as it so happened he played king e8 and then king g3 rook d1 bishop e2 rook g1 was played and somehow if you see here white managed to coordinate his pieces and get the move f4 in it's still quite difficult but now what happens is if you take here i can take and i can hope to create a passed pawn which is already a victory if you don't take then white will take on g5 and then get his knight to e5 when everything will be secure and this pawn will be a weakness and then you have a weakness on b6 and g5 so the knight can attack uh, g5 from f7 in one move uh, b6 in one move from d7 and that's also that's how complicated this end game was uh, but eventually this move is a ta nice tactical move. You can't take a bishop because knight e5 check wins the rook. And so uh, as we mentioned, white has got all his pieces nicely placed now. And this was easy now. e4, he managed to convert this well. Cord this is something which top players do well. They know they have the patience. They don't hurry. And here uh, knight e5. Rook f8 takes bishop f5 and now the knight is coming to d7 at a later date. Pieces keep moving around. Rook a1, king c3 and yeah finally somehow through magical means the b6 pawn is lost and uh, that's game over. Sorry, knight c8, here b6, king c2, rook e1, knight d6, f7, and b7. And uh, Duda resigned here. The endgame was instructive, I would say. <laughs> Not at all easy uh, for Karuana to win. But what I liked overall is his play in this game. First of all, guys, believe in the power of exchange slow sometimes. It's not as drawish as you would imagine it to be. I know it's a dull opening. I'm not trying to sugarcoat it by saying it's a beautiful opening. I know it's dull. But it a lot of it depends on weaknesses, activity, all these little things. And if you think you are a superior positional player, which 
Karuana felt in this game that he is positionally superior to Duda. Maybe when it comes to tactics, Duda is equally good. And hence he chose this opening. So it can be an opening whenever you face a very tactical or an aggressive opponent. You can play this way and it can give you a, a point much more easily than indulging in some complex lines. I hope you had a good time here and you learnt a lot. This is Sagar Shah signing off. Bye-bye.